So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Abby Bronson. I head up the research function at Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. You heard a lot from me saying everyone's names yesterday, but I'm really excited to be able to introduce this panel discussion today because, you know, why are we doing this? Every time you open up the newspaper, you hear something about gene therapy, Glybera, you hear about CRISPR, and what do you as families have to know? What do you have to understand to be able to sort of navigate through all this news and all this excitement? So I, um, we put this panel together and we kind of assigned everybody a different question. So hopefully everyone will stick to topic, um, and we're going to try to really sort out some of the issues that you have to think about with gene therapy as we move forward. So, And the first person who will speak is Dr. Barry Byrne from the University of Florida. Great. Thanks so much, Abby, and thank you all for being here. I know you all have an intense interest in this topic. It's really um, an important time uh, in the field to address some of the questions that I'm sure you all have. Uh, so we have an outstanding panel covering the whole spectrum of what this field has to offer for, uh, for boys with Duchenne. So I'm going to give a two-minute introduction to try to set the tone for where we are now from where we began, on, uh, on, and I think uh, I was uh, reminiscing a bit that it was actually 20 years ago that Jude Zhao Zhao and I, uh, in separate publications, first uh, described AAV as it uh, has the capability of transducing muscle. So if I can have the uh, next slide here. Um, you know, we're in the genomic era now, and this has helped define the concept of genes as medicines. And, and really, uh, this is embodied in this Time magazine cover from 2012, uh, really 10 years after the genomics revolution started. And uh, really, based on, on findings in our DNA, uh, many, many conditions can be diagnosed early. And we think, even though this cover says these tests point to risk, but not um, always a cure. In fact, I would say that's not exactly true now. We think this information actually points the way to specific therapies or personalized medicine. Um, we can think that genes actually can serve as drugs if, uh, if we can go to the next slide, you see uh, this is not exactly what a gene drug might look like, but something like this, and we'll use some uh, examples of how genes can be delivered into cells uh, throughout the body now. Um, and if you go to the next slide, uh, we're using a tool called AAV, and you'll hear a lot about this during the session. Um, this is a depiction of the surface of AAV uh, developed by one of the uh, faculty at University of Florida who studies the structural biology of AAV. But these vectors have been known for quite some time. Um, and since, uh-oh, uh starting again. Oh, there, it's just down here. It's not showing. Um, if you see AAV being delivered into a cell, you see this is the behavior. It enters the cell surface and then transits into the nucleus where the genetic material is dropped off and makes a therapeutic protein. So this is the concept, in effect, behind gene therapy. So you can see the intense interest that really developed around uh, the, the mid-1990s uh, when it was evident that AV could be used in a wide variety of genetic diseases where a single gene might be missing. And uh, this is the Time Magazine cover from 1996 when we published those first articles about, um, about AAV. I don't think we've achieved this objective yet. But interestingly, this past week, uh, the cover of Time actually discusses uh, the technology behind CRISPR-Cas9 and the opportunities for gene editing. So and Dr. Olson will conclude the session by discussing this aspect. So that's the brief introduction of where we've been over a 20-year span trying to develop this technology where a personalized or precision medicine relying on genes as drugs can uh, hopefully have a very high impact in conditions like Duchenne. So I'll end there and begin uh, the first talk by Carl Morris from Solid Biosciences. Uh, thanks, Barry. <clears throat> So um, 
I, I was, was asked to give sort of an overview on our history and, and where sort of uh, gene therapy is as far as sort of drug development. And, and, and I put this up, and I, I really want to highlight this. This image persists, and I probably am continuing that persistence, of, but it, it persists as, as the problems with gene therapy. So Jesse Gelsinger um, was, was one of the first patients in a in gene therapy trial, and, he, and he, he passed on that trial. But little is known about sort of Corey Haas, and, and you know he was blind, now he can see. Um, there's also, in 2011, hemophilia trials are coming along. And ultimately, in 2012, there's a, there was an approved product, a gene therapy product, Glybera. So we've really advanced from, from both in vectors and, and in design. So we started with this adenovirus that, that had sort of certain properties to deliver genes to, to the tissues. And now we've moved over into AAVs and lentivirus that, that have a much better sort of safety profile. Um, <clears throat> safety profile, and now we're, 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 we're still concerned about safety, obviously, but, but now it's an, an efficacy and a delivery issue, and trying to figure out how to, to improve the packaging, improving the delivery of, of, of the, the virus itself. <clears throat> so really, what is gene therapy, gene transfer? So what we're trying to do is take a, a piece of DNA and stick it into a cell in the body. We're using AAV, in, in, for the most, case, most part, uh, to, to deliver that uh, gene to, to the body. And so we have to go through a process um, of, of identifying the right gene um, and, and uh, performing the appropriate studies to, to get it into, um, uh, into the uh, place where it can do uh, provide benefit. <clears throat> so is gene therapy development really that much different um, than <clears throat> normal drug de delivery with small molecules or biologics? There, there are a very, there are major differences, but essentially the concept is the same. You, you have to find out what you're going to use as your drug. You have to build your drug. You have to test your drug. You have to produce your drug, and make sure you do all the safety and the efficacy studies, and ultimately run through the phase, phase the clinical trials. So, in in that frame, it, it really is not that much different than than what you've been hearing about with antibodies and, and biologics and small molecules that are coming and oligonucleotides that have been sort of moving uh, in in the Duchenne community for a while now. It's 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 nothing scary about it. It's just a, a it's just a delivery vehicle that that a lot of people, including the, uh, the people on the panel, have have done uh, have tested and 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 sort of confirmed that there's. Um, sort of a path forward and, and can be used as a therapeutic. So I, I, I went on to clinicaltrials.gov and just typed in gene therapy um, and, and virus. And there's 159 clinical trials that are currently open um, worldwide. And, and so 33 are open and when you use AAV as a keyword as well. So there's a lot of activity going on and we're not just in isolation here. There, there's a, a huge amount of, of gene therapy activity um, that you can just sort of go onto clinicaltrials.gov. If you click on the map, you can see this. You can use whatever keywords you want to pull out where the trials are and, and, and uh, what, what is being done. So I, just to take one step back and, and really think about, um, there, there's been a lot of hemophilia studies uh, uh, and gene therapy studies, and so it, it provides a good opportunity to talk about the clinical lessons learned. Um, so for, for uh, hemophilia B, they needed to put the factor IX into an AAV and deliver that, and they put it into the liver and produced, produced the, the factor IX to, to circulate in the blood. And, and it was used an AAV, uh, AV8, a serotype of AAV to, that had a hydropism or, or to the liver itself. And this was a single administration, and then they were left alone. So what we, we wanted to, what they look for, it, it, there's sort of certain considerations. I'm sorry, this is bouncing around. That, so one of the, the issues that I think Jerry will, will uh, uh, talk about is, is really looking at and trying to make sure that you get um, uh, efficacy and delivery to, to the, um, the tissue. So short-term therapy was used in this study to, to uh, reduce um, a potential liver issue with the ALT spike that you can see in green on the left. So prednisone was introduced to try and suppress that and maintain overall efficacy um, of, of the factor nine. So that's one, one thing that, that's now being considered, and I think Jerry is, is using prophylactically prednisone uh, to, to suppress, to potentially suppress uh, this issue in, in the SMA study. 
Sorry, we're having issues with the TV down there. Uh, another consideration is really who, who can get onto the study and, and thinking about the pre-existing antibodies. So the TIDA, so the AVs, um, uh, we've, we've, most of us have been exposed to AAVs in some form. And so therefore we have antibodies that may limit the, uh, the efficacy um, and, and, and prevent sort of the, the use of the AAVs. So a number of studies, as, as shown here, have been uh, sort of looked at this. And there's, there's anywhere from sort of 20 to, to 90 percent of, of antibodies, pre-existing antibodies in the circulation that may impact um, the, the, the efficacy of, of any therapy going forward. So there has to be you know, thoughts around what titer and, and how to, to, to move, uh, move forward if this is actual, uh, actually the, the case in DMD as well. And, and finally, so the, another thing is how, how long is this going to last? Gene therapy at present is a, a single delivery. You inject once and you're done. Uh, so we have to think about how long will, will the, the transgene uh, maintain its expression, how durable will the response be. And so there's, again, evidence from, from um, a hemophilia study is that 10 years after, after a single injection, there's uh, still evidence of, of the transgene being expressed. So that... That, that means that, that you know, re-administration is, is, is likely to be needed, particularly in a, a, a disease like DMD. But it, it, it gives us sort of hope that, that we can actually go in and, uh, um, you know, we, we don't have to, there will be just sort of not have to be a sort of a yearly re-administration, but there will be sort of durable effects. So what's the current status? Really, we, we know that we have an approved gene th product, and that, that sort of gives us hope that there at least is a, um, a tentative regulatory pathway to move forward. Also, there, there's some really good positive data that, that um, are coming out of, of clinical studies in, in neuromuscular indications with systemic delivery of AV. Uh, and, and, and Jerry um, is, is the key to a lot of that work. And then finally, even today, so there was an article I, I published today around a uh, hemophilia study from Spark Therapeutics where, um, again, an, another face that we should be thinking about, uh, Ryan Halleck, who, who is now able to plow fields, a 10-acre field, um, and after he's, he's had a single administration of gene therapy. So we're in a good spot, and I think now it's, it's a time to think about where we're going in, in DMD. And really, so there's, currently, as, as far as I could find, there might be more, but, but there were three uh, 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 gene therapy studies actually um, open right now um, per, per clinicaltrials.gov, one with Galgi T2, the statin, as well as a microdystrophin uh, by invitation, and that's at, your, at Children's Nationwide. And also in preclinical, late-stage preclinical de development, there's three, three um, organizations, companies, Bamboo Therapeutics uh, with Zhao Zhao and, and Jude, um, solid, solid, so us, and then uh, George Dixon and Jonathan also have microdystrophin constructs that, that are, are in the, the development phase and will hopefully be sort of moving, progressing towards a clinic uh, very shortly. That's all I have. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, and the next speaker, as uh, Jude Samolsky, is going to talk about how vectors are made, what are the considerations for the design of the vectors, and, um, and then and Zhao Zhao will follow him with how to fit the large dystrophin gene into the small constraints of AV. Hello, uh, thank, thank you. I want to thank Pat and the organizers for inviting us to participate. Um, I've been tasked with the objective of trying to explain um, how vectors deliver genes to target cells and how would they deliver genes to muscle cells. So for most of my scientific colleagues, I apologize, but I've chosen to bring this talk down to the level of which I best understand it. Um, in very simple concepts, um, being able to take something outside the body and deliver it inside the body. So hopefully, I'll give you a flavor of what we're doing uh, and have been doing. Um, I, uh, this is not me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, let me back up. Uh, gene delivery, you hear this 
words spoken all the time and you ask yourself, what does it mean? How does it work? What you're basically taking is a nucleic acid or sequence that codes for a specific gene and you're trying to deliver it into, uh, actually, this, I missed the slide. So anyway, um, you're trying to deliver it. So there are two possible ways of delivering. One is using viruses. As you can imagine, viruses have evolved for millions of years to very effectively put DNA outside the body, inside the body. If you've ever had the chicken pox or the flu, you know how efficient these invisible um, delivery systems are. Um, there's another effort being uh, carried out called non-viral, in which people are synthesizing uh, particles that are synthetic to look like viruses. And when you look at the virus collection that's available to us, you can see they come in all ranges of sizes and dimensions. The one on the far uh, top left-hand corner is herpes virus, and the one in the bottom uh, right-hand corner is a bacteriophage. And again, if you look at nanoparticles, you can see these are synthetic molecules that are trying to mimic or uh, recapitulate what viruses look like and their ability to encapsulate a, a nucleic acid. So terminology that we use that we throw around frequently is you hear the virus and you hear the gene, but technically that concept is basically what we call the vector and that when you put that combination together, you now have what's referred to as the vector, what's responsible for delivering the nucleic acid. And there's basically two mechanisms by which you can take advantage of this. You can do what's referred to as ex vivo, where you take cells out of the body, you put them into a Petri dish, and you deliver the gene into those cells, and then you put the cells back into the body. Uh, this technology is being developed, and it's most likely to work for stem cells, which are a self-renewing type of cell in your body that will um, generate more and more copies of itself. Um, most of the delivery systems that are being utilized today uh, with success are what's called in vivo, where you take the virus and by some mechanism you inject it into the patient's body, uh, either into the retina for uh, eye blindnesses or into the heart for cardiomyopathy or stuff like that. And when you look at something like the uh, muscle and trying to get genes to every muscle in the body, and that's a daunting task, but if you look at the cartoon that's up there, you can see that the blood vessels go to every muscle in the body and it feeds it. So if you can deliver these reagents into the bloodstream, you actually have a natural carrier that will take it and distribute it throughout the body. So when we talk about a vector and we talk about intra intravenous injection, we're basically referring to putting that payload into the bloodstream and hoping that it circulates throughout the body. So what I wanted to do to give you an appreciation of the world that we work in um, is take you and, and show you the size of the particles we're working with. I'm actually very fortunate. Uh, and two hours up the highway about 30 years ago, I was the first student for Nate Muzichka at the University of Florida. And we cloned AAV as a viral vector in his research lab some 30 years ago. And, um, at that time, being young and naive, we were going to cure all the genetic diseases within the next four years. Uh, as you can see, that you get humble very quickly uh, when you realize what's involved. And so this has been a continuing effort on our part to try to optimize these reagents so that we can deliver genes more effectively. And so I'm just showing you a picture of, on the left-hand side, you see Jenner, who was actually vaccinating his own child with cowpox. Again, he was taking genetic information outside of the body and introducing it inside, and that information educated the immune system to develop an immune response so when smallpox was running uh, as a rampant plague, it would fight itself off. And so we are basically doing something that's been done for over 200 years. We're just refining it to have more control over the delivery of these genetic materials. So let's look at what can be put on the head of a pin. As you go up in magnification at two millimeters, you're looking at a human hair. And as we increase this, you're now looking at hopefully something you didn't have in your bed last night, which is a bed mite. <laughs> as you can increase the magnification, you can see when we get around 20 micrometers, that's the big thing in the middle is a yeast organism. This is a red blood cell on my right-hand side. 
And down here at two microns, you can see the hot dog looking shape uh, organism. That's E. coli that gets you sick when you don't cook your hamburgers completely. The little balls on the right hand side are strept, uh, Streptococcus aureus, it causes strep throat. And as you continue to go in magnification, you can see at 200 nanometers, that's an Ebola virus that looks like a cane. And as you continue to go in magnification, at 20 nanometers, this is the AAV particle that we're talking about today that we're trying to deliver the muscular dystrophy gene into every muscle of your body. So what is it? It's a proteinaceous shell. It has inside of it a piece of DNA. And in the laboratory, we've gotten very efficient at taking out the information that the virus carries and substituting it with the genetic information that we're interested in. What's so valuable about these shells is that they have evolved to go through very harsh conditions. AAV comes in through the upper respiratory, goes through the gut, and is secreted. And on its surface, it has zip codes that tell, tell it to which cells it should go to. And again, as you look at these, you realize that these viruses all have very specific zip codes that tell it to go to either brain cells, uh, muscle cells, liver cells, and so forth. And so what we're basically trying to do is substitute the Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene in place of the AAV gene and have that protein shell become the carrier. And one simple way to think about this is we're basically developing molecular FedEx trucks. These are carriers that are going to take genetic information outside of the body to a very specific target inside the body. And then and the example of how we develop these in the lab, if this is the perfect time of year. If you go outside, you see these fireflies are lighting up all over. You can take the gene from the firefly and you can put it inside of the AAV particle, similar to what I've described earlier. And then if you take this vector and stick it into the bloodstream, you can then look at an animal model and see where it goes. And here's an example. Where on the left-hand side, you can see the AV vector referred to as AV2 delivers the firefly gene to the liver. This is actually glowing inside of the animal, and we have cameras that will allow you to take pictures of it. The AV8 vector goes into the liver, but it also spreads throughout the body. And the chimeric vector that we generated in the laboratory goes to the heart and to the muscle, but it no longer goes to the liver. So you can see that we're becoming uh, quite aware at how to change the zip codes that are on the outside of these vectors. Again, one way to look at this is they're, they're almost like Velcro, and you can go in and stitch in amino acids that we either let it bind to a target or let go of a target. And in doing so, we develop these so-called chimeric vectors or delivery reagents and we test them in the laboratory, typically in small animals, and then we validate this in larger animal models to convince ourselves that we can deliver it to all the muscles and that it's efficient at delivering the transgene. Uh, this is typically done routinely, and then at this point, when we're convinced we have the molecular FedEx truck that's going to get to the target tissue, we turn these type of projects over to my colleague, Zhao Zhao, who's the um, amazing engineer that ends up taking the gene such as the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the largest gene in the human genome, and somehow engineers it to fit into the smallest vector known, the AAV particle. So I'll stop there and let Zhao take you through the next journey. Thank you. Thanks, Jude. And now, uh, Zhao Zhao will tell you how, as he exactly as Jude said, we uh, perform this feat of engineering to, to make only the essential part of dystrophin fit into the vector. Um, I'm so glad uh, um, I'm attending the PPMD meeting again when I was in University of Pittsburgh in the late 90s and the early uh, 20s. And I attend every meeting, and uh, I see all the new faces here. And Pat Furlong is still the matriarch uh, of the, the pack, and I think she did a great job. And um, So today I was asked to um, tell you uh, how we can uh, shrink uh, the huge dystrophin gene into a mini gene so we can fit into a AAV virus to treat the muscular dystrophy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And um, uh, so AAV is the smallest virus, and uh, um, actually, uh, um, 
the shoe engine is the largest thing in the body. And I have to make this a uh, conflict of interest declaration. And I'm a scientific co-founder of uh, Bamboo Therapeutics that works on DMD. And uh, um, so uh, you can see that uh, when you um, put a, a gene such as uh, um, LAGZ, like it's a reporter gene that turns the cell blue. And you put an AAV, you inject into the mice and, or you inject into the vein. The, the virus actually goes to the muscle and the heart deliver the gene over there. It's the lifetime for uh, in the mice and the, in, the, in the hamsters. And uh, so we thought, that, you know, AAV is great for muscular dystrophy, but uh, its packaging size is about 5 kb. Um, but when you look at the uh, Duchovin gene, it's 2.4 million base pairs. It, it's a huge uh, task for us. And, but we have to somehow truncate this Duchovin um, to put into AAV. And so um, if you, from this cartoon, you can show this is the muscle cell membrane structure. You can see that the, the red uh, bar over there is a lung uh, protein. That's the dystrophin. And um, it make the connection between, uh, between the cytoskeletal structure in, in the muscle cell. OK, so uh, the, the N terminus that anchors on the cytoskeletal structure, and the, there's a cystine region that anchors on the cell muscle cell membrane, and also associated with the dystrophin um, protein associated complex. And if dystrophin is missing, the entire protein complex in the cell membrane is also uh, missing, and, and the, um, the cell membrane and the cytoskeletal structure is disconnected and the muscle cell membrane is constantly damaged. So uh, to truncate this uh, dystrophin, we have to keep the N-terminus to anchor on the cytoskeletal structure and also the cystine region that anchors on the cell membrane. And in the middle, there are 24 repeats. And uh, it's like uh, uh, 24 links of, of a chain. You can shorten the chain. And so we were inspired by, uh, by a paper um, from a Kate Davis lab, and they, she published the paper in Nature um, okay, um, in uh, 1990. And uh, she basically found that uh, in a family, uh, a patient had this uh, um, dystrophin gene truncated almost half by half. And see, this is a uh, family tree. You can see that um, one of the patients, um, he can walk in his 50s, and the other patient can walk in his 70s, and the third patient, this is a black box showing that, that he was a bodybuilder and he, he complains about muscle sore after the workout. Okay, so when uh, um, okay, so when Kate Davis lab and they um, uh, examined the, the dystrophin, they found out that the, the N terminus uh, region is still there when you run the gel, and the, the C terminus region is there. But in the center, uh, there is a huge deletion. Uh, there are only eight out of the 24 rods remaining. But this dystrophin protein is reduced, but it's highly functional. So we thought maybe we can make something like that. And so we started to uh, do the lag work, and we make the, a series of uh, mini dystrophin, um, you know, start from, with, uh, from bottom uh, one rod, two rods, three rods, four rods, five rods, six rods. And if it's a seven rods and it's too big for AAV, then we test all of them, and the four, five, six rods worked pretty well. Then the, um, so we were pretty excited, and we injected that in mice, and we published a paper in 2000 in PNS paper uh, in the Presidium of National Academy of Sciences. And I was I presented some data at the PPMD meeting, and every time the parents put me on the hot seat and saying, "When we're going to see this happen in the in the clinic?" and Fortunately, I uh, uh, got the Dr. Jeremy Mandel and the Jules Samolsky helped, and we did a first clinical trial by IM injection. But that's not the, the way to treat muscular tissue if you have delivered the gene into the whole body. Uh, so after this uh, paper is published, and many other labs also published a very similar construct, and that they are called mini or micro dystrophin. And so the, the common feature is that the, the N-terminus, that's the head of the dystrophin, has to be there to anchor on the cytoskeletal structure. And the, the cystine rich region has to be there to uh, um, anchor uh, on the cell membrane. So it's a uh, membrane and the cytoskeletal is connected. And then the gene is under the control of a muscle-specific element that can drive heart and muscle-specific expression and only express the gene in, in those tissues. And if you inject a vector into the MDX mice, that's the model, and you see the Jovin protein expression, and the, the muscle becomes stronger, and the, and the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the pathology is improved. However, the MDX mice 
um, as yesterday's talk, they have this eutrophin protein upregulated that compensates the eutrophin uh, um, lack of function, so uh, the, the phenotype is mild. And the K-Dave's lab um, made another mouse model. It's a eutrophin and eutrophin double knockout. They become very sick, and their lifespan is shortened by, uh, you know, they live only up to only four months. They were not active in the cage, but uh, um, if you treat them with mini dystrophin gene or micro dystrophin, they become very active, and uh, um, their lifespan extended from uh, four months to more than one half, uh, one half years. And the, the, the structure, uh, you know, their hand leg had this uh, uh, contracture, and that's seen in some human patients. But uh, after treatment, you can see that they can kick and actually. Uh, and also those treated mice, they can produce pops, and um, so their fertility is restored. In other words, all those mini micro if you deliver extensively into the muscle and the heart, they are very therapeutic. The, the difference between different constructs are, are pretty minor. And uh, um, so w um, our lab and other labs also tested the dystrophin gene uh, in dog model, and uh, um, and the first one, we, well, I just want to show you some examples. And we did a limb perfusion. We have a tourniquet put on the hind leg, and we injected the AAV virus, AAV9, carry a human mini-dystrophin gene into the leg. And, um, and biopsy showed that it's surprisingly, and uh, um, the nine-injected leg also had the dystrophin expression. You see those red circles there, the, the mini-dystrophin. And Western bra showed similar results left and right. And so we got confused. Actually, the fact is that AAV leaked into the system, actually infected the cells throughout the body. That's, I think, the first evidence that AAV can deliver genes throughout the body. And the uh, uh, biopsy of the 12 months and uh, two years, four years, showed consistent, uh, stable gene expression. Jerry was sacrificed eight year, more than eight years later, and the um, immunofluorescent staining showed residual gene expression in the heart, in the skeletal muscle, the varied degrees. Um, you know, some muscle had the over 90% of uh, mini dystrophin expression. And to make sure those protein, they are not the revertin fibers, and there's antibody that can specifically line up the revertin fiber. You can see the bottom uh, panel, there's those arrow. Uh, highlighted there the spontaneous revertin fibers, and you can see that in patients and animals as well. But those red uh, circles on top, they are the, the mini dystrophin product. So we can tell which one is the transgene product, which one is the spontaneous revertin fiber. That's an advantage using the mini or micro dystrophin. And you can also do so called Western blot to show that because mini dystrophin, the molecular weight is smaller on the gel. You can see the, the lower band, they are the um, the dystrophin produced by, uh, in the various uh, muscle group in jelly, and the left top panel, uh, that's the wild type dystrophin, they are very large, and uh, with the serous dilution, you can see the amount of uh, dystrophin <laughs> expression was pretty stable. And so we had another dog, we just did a simple IV injection, we did not use tourniquet, and four months later, we did a biopsy, the dystrophin expression is pretty overwhelming, and the dog was sacrificed uh, 14 months later, um, you can see that, that there's overwhelming expression in all different muscle groups, including the heart that's on the top uh, left panel. And uh, again, if you do Western blot, you're going to see that the, um, the mini dystrophin is at the bottom. You can see they're much smaller, and the wild type control is on the top left, and they are pretty large, you can tell. So by two means, uh, immunofluorescent staining and all Western blot, you can sort of semi quantitate uh, determining how many uh, muscle cells had the dystrophin expression, gene also expressed in the heart. And so this is the, the video of Jerry, and one year after treatment, she is still a muscular dystrophy dog. And, um, but uh, um, when five years later, we, we went to uh, Texas, uh, saw her, and um, she actually was uh, doing a little bit better. And uh, Eight years later, and she can still walk, and uh, but she had some heart problems, and um, she was sacrificed, and she was our hero, and you know she experienced the five biopsies and multiple uh, MRI imaging, and uh, you know did a muscle force measurement, and so this is an example showing that uh, how the dystrophin uh, gene can be delivered using AAV into the large animal models, and uh, and, and also can somehow. Uh, achieve stable uh, therapeutic gene expression. Um, I'll stop there and uh, 
thank my colleagues and um, you know, it's a long-term collaborator, Dr. John Carnegie and uh, Samolsky and my lab members. Thank Thanks you. so much, Zhao Zhao. Okay, the next speaker is Jerry Mandel, and he's going to dive into some of the complexities of the immunology. Well, Carl, Jude, and, and Zhao Zhao got to tell you um, the, the plans for how you get there. And I just want to go over, um, actually, Barry and Abby gave me the, the task of telling you what happens. One of the barriers that we have um, in gene therapy, and this is an uh, experience we've learned over the last 10 years. In fact, I have this picture up here because on my left are two colleagues who joined me in this clinical trial um, of dystrophin where we learned about immunity in patients with Duchenne dystrophy. And one, there, are two, there are two aspects of this that are important as we move forward. One is when you take one of these microdystrophins or mini dystrophins that Zhao Zhao described and express it into the normal patient, into the, to, the, uh, to the Duchenne patient, um, and you express that in a region where there is a deletion already, what happens is if you get expression in that area, you get an immune response. The reason that's important is we were always taught that you could, uh, dystrophin uh, was expressed in something that, that are called revertin fibers. Revertin fibers are again what Zhao Zhao showed you. They're small clusters of, of uh, gene expressing fibers that result from basically exon skipping. And you see on, the, on my right here, there is a small cluster that's lighting up. And, um, and, there, if you, and that is uh, because you're staining the, the far part of the gene uh, or the far part of the protein that is expressed. And why is it expressed? This is a patient who many of you are familiar with and I am very familiar with who has an exon 50 uh, deletion in a clinical trial. And yet, when we uh, go to... Um, count down where, where did this uh, gene start expressing again. Um, it, it expressed in exon 57, and we can do that by taking monoclonal antibodies and counting down each exon to tell where it expresses. And the result is uh, sometimes, but not always we hope, is that in this area of, of deletion uh, or renewed expression, we have a misfolded protein, and it probably doesn't show up well there. I was hoping it would show up a little better, but this is what we call an LE spot, um, where we can see exactly which, uh, which, where, the, where the new gene expression is, and I showed you it was in exon 57, and that's exactly what we see in this patient. So we need to be aware of this, and, and I'll mention in a minute um, what we do in clinical trials to try to circumvent that. Um, the, one of the things that we do in clinical trials is to uh, be aware of the cassette. That's that small thing on the bottom there, the microdystrophin that Zhao Zhao again described. And we, uh, we can only enroll patients um, who have... Uh, for example, in this cassette, we enrolled patients who have DMD mutations between exons 18 and 58. If we do that, we won't have an immune response because the microdystrophin doesn't express in that area. So it's, a, it's safe harbor for that kind of cassette. And that's the kind of thing that, we're learned, that we've learned over the past 10 years. Um, the next thing I'd like to comment on is uh, the other thing that we are faced with uh, with gene therapy, and that's the immune response to AAV. Um, you've never seen more elegant slides than Jude showed you about AAV. But AAV is a, is a foreign protein, and we see an immune response. Now, this is a preclinical. Uh, we, we screen every patient to see whether they have any evidence of an immune response to AAV before we do the trial. And this one, um, the, 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 uh, the high bar there that you see is a control bar. And um, if you're in the back of the room, I'm sure you can't see the other two. The other two mean that there wasn't any immune response in baseline. 
But look what happened now when we're two weeks later. And this is the typical time when we see an immune response to the capsid, that beautiful thing that, that Jude showed you. And we see this immune response. And when that, what that means clinically is this. If we put in a virus, about two weeks later, we see this pink colored peak. That pink colored peak is in an LE spot that measures T cell responses, cellular responses to the AAV vector. In this case, um, not only was the cellular response to AAV vector, but it was to liver cells. And the blue line is the liver cell response uh, for high AST and ALT. And you see it's exactly at two weeks. When we, when we learned that we could suppress this with prednisone, and um, if you see here, this is, an, this is another patient that we've done where we started the pred, prednisone, or these are infants, we actually use prednisolone. We started one day before gene transfer, and now um, we have no elevation of the blue line. We still have an immune response to AAV, and we're gonna see that, but we don't have to be concerned now about uh, liver enzyme elevation. So hopefully my last slide will show up here. No, you, I need my last slide if you can rescue it. If you can't, um, what we've learned in, in this is that we need to, uh, before we do any clinical trial, we check the patients carefully. Do they have any pre-existing immunity to the virus? Do they have any pre-existing immunity to the microdystrophin. Got it? And, and, uh, and then we, um, we, don't, we never express the, the microdystrophin in an area of the patient's deletion. So we've learned how to circumvent these problems. And that's what we've learned basically over the last decade. So we have a, we have a path to move forward with all of the things that we've learned. So thank you very much. Okay, we'll keep going now. And the next speaker is Eric Olson. We'll just switch to his slides. And uh, Eric, you want to come up and talk about a very exciting technology. Uh, again, in vivo delivery using AAV vectors in many instances, but uh, he'll tell us about the um, ability to edit genes using CRISPR system. Okay, thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking Pat Furlong for inviting me to be here. This is my first PPMD meeting, and I really want to tell you that I have been inspired and motivated by this experience. So I'm going to talk to you today about one of the fastest moving, most game changing technologies in science. This is one that I think all of you have heard of and will be hearing much more about, often referred to as CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. It was recently uh, highlighted on the cover of uh, Time magazine. And as many of you may have read over the past few days, the FDA just approved the first human clinical trial for CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to modify immune cells as an anti-cancer therapy. And this is undoubtedly the first of what will, we hope, ultimately be many genetic therapies that are based on this uh, new technology. So since I think many of you may not be familiar with this technology, I thought I'd spend a few moments uh, describing it to you. This is a technology that evolved in bacteria as an anti-immune system and has now been co-opted by uh, molecular biologists such as myself to manipulate genes in any organism, including in the human genome. In every cell of our bodies, there is DNA with three billion letters. And this new technology is makes it possible to manipulate and change a single letter in the DNA code with high precision. And the way it works is as a two-component system. Suppose you have a mutation in the DNA schematized here. Suppose this is the dystrophin gene. This two-component system uses a short RNA strand 
referred to as a guide strand, which you can see here. This guide strand, through complementarity with the appropriate sequence in the DNA, can seek out as a homing system and can find any gene or any sequence in the entire human genome, including a mutation in the dystrophin gene. And when this guide sequence finds its target in a cell, it recruits an enzyme called Cas9, shown here in yellow. And Cas9 functions essentially as molecular scissors to cut the DNA, and it can then repair or remove of the mutation. And this can happen, as I mentioned, with absolute uh, precision at any site in the, the DNA for which a guide strand uh, is generated. Once it cuts, it can completely eliminate the mutation, or it can modify genes in many uh, other ways. So this approach has obvious potential for correction of many types of monogenic human uh, disorders. This is how uh, it works. This is a diagram at the top of the uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene, dystrophin, which you all know is the largest gene in the genome. And in the mouse model for muscular dystrophy, there's a single mutation, one letter changed in the 23rd exon of this gene, which stops the production of the dystrophin protein. We reasoned that we could devise guide strands to deliver Cas9 to excise the <coughs> mutation in this gene, shown here, through a method that we refer to as myo-editing, or muscle gene editing, excising the mutant exon and allowing then the protein to recreate the production of the normal dystrophin protein as shown here. What are the key features of this new technology that distinguish it from all other approaches that have been applied for uh, muscular dystrophy or any other diseases? In principle, this technique allows for the permanent co correction and elimination of the disease-causing mutation. Other approaches that are taken in typical diseases involve the application of therapies on top of the uh, mutation that already exists in, uh, the, in the, the target gene. In principle, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing could allow for a one-time treatment. Once the mutation is eliminated from the patient's cells, there's no longer a need, in principle, for further therapy. This technique can potentially reach all affected cell types uh, in the body, and I'll show you evidence that that occurs at least in mice. And we know that there are more than 4,700 different mutations in the dystrophin gene that have been identified in DMD boys worldwide. And this approach can correct up to 80% in principle of the mutations that have been identified in DMD boys. And in a simplified version that we've adapted, we can now uh, combine those mutations into each of 12 categories that can be corrected with one of 12 guide RNAs for those mutations. So what about the issue of delivery of the enzyme and the guide RNA to all the tissues of the body, all muscles and the heart, and as we heard beautifully described by the groundbreaking work of Dr. Samolsky and uh, Zhao Zhao, as well as Dr. Mendel, AAV, various adeno-associated viruses, in particular AAV8 or AAV9, home specifically to muscle and heart. And so we've engineered AAVs to carry the Cas9 enzyme and to carry the guide RNA to deliver that enzyme specifically to the mutation in the dystrophin gene. And we've introduced those into the MDX mouse with muscular dystrophy to perform exon skipping by cutting at both sides surrounding the mutant exon. And you can see at the bottom the results from these experiments. In red shows the dystrophin protein in a cross-section through muscle fibers of a normal mouse, homogeneously stained for dystrophin. In the center panel is the muscle from the MDX mouse, which has no dystrophin. And on the far right, you can see an animal that was injected with the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing components in a virus with a single injection 
three weeks after injection, and you can see the appearance of stable dystrophin-positive muscle fibers. Now, it's not perfect. These are still early, early stage. But at least 20% of the muscle fibers and a large proportion of heart muscle cells can be converted to dystrophin-expressing cells by this technology. And this approach has now been replicated by at least three different laboratories around the United States and elsewhere in the world. So it's a reproducible and it's a robust method, at least in a mouse model, for the restoration, stable restoration of dystrophin protein uh, in this uh, organism. So what are the challenges and what are the unknowns with respect to advancing this technology eventually to the clinic? One of the key challenges or issues that we need to confront is the possibility of off-target effects of gene editing. That is, what if the guide RNA, instead of going to the dystrophin gene, inadvertently goes to some other gene and leads to editing of that other gene? This is something that we need to be mindful of, and the FDA has, as I said, approved the first trial, but uh, we'll pay close attention to the possibility of off-target effects. So far, in animal models, and there have been many, many, many studies done in animal models, there have been no pathologic off-target effects seen, and that's because the human body has a very efficient DNA repair system to correct potential off-target effects. But certainly going forward, one needs to be mindful of this. Second issue raised by uh, Jerry, the issue of immune responses. In this case, might there be an immune response to Cas9, which is a foreign protein? So far, in animal models in which the gene editing has been performed, there have not been significant immune responses observed. But we also feel that perhaps low-dose immunosuppression might mitigate potential uh, immune responses should they eventually occur. Another challenge, and a significant one, is scale-up. A mouse is not a boy. We can cure this in a mouse. Uh, can we scale up? I believe that we can scale up because there's been very extremely promising, groundbreaking studies carried out by Jerry on the use of AAV in other uh, human uh, disorders with positive effects. And so I, it should be possible to scale up with high titer AAVs to deliver Cas9 and the guide RNA to muscles in a systemic way, and that's the approach that we hope to ultimately take. And lastly, as in any drug development or therapeutic development program, delivery is always an issue that one uh, needs to uh, confront. But again, we believe that using AAV vectors, it, uh, it will be possible to uh, surmount this um, challenge. So this is our vision for correcting the mutations in Duchenne muscular dystrophy using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. In Dallas, we have a robust muscular dystrophy clinic. Patients can come in with a small sample from their blood. We can identify the mutation uh, in those boys, and we use the, the blood then to create stem cells, a, a permanent repository of cells from that individual patient, or in fact, we don't even need the blood from the patient. We can just introduce the patient's mutation into stem cells using CRISPR-Cas as an artificial system. We then convert these stem cells into muscle cells in a dish, and we test the guide strand RNA for optimization for what is the best sequence of the guide RNA for correcting the mutation. We then advance that optimized guide RNA into the mouse, and as I've shown you evidence now that we can correct the muscular dystrophy mutation in the mouse, and we've made humanized mice now, in which we've introduced into mice each of the many muta common mutations seen in boys with muscular dystrophy, so we can correct those in an animal model. And in the last step, we hope to eventually uh, advance this work uh, into humans through the types of approaches uh, that I've described. So I am incredibly excited about this work and its potential, and I'd be happy to share uh, further thoughts on this with anyone. My email address is there if any of you would like to uh, correspond with us and keep abreast of our progress. And lastly, I'll just mention that we're having a symposium in Dallas on the latest breakthroughs in CRISPR-Cas9 genome technology for Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, in August, if any of you are interested. Thank you very much.
We have 10 minutes. So we have uh, 10 minutes for questions, and of course they can range on any topic so that everyone can hear you. Is there an audience microphone? Or I'll repeat the question. You want to start? Go ahead. You mentioned uh, Dr. Olson. Oh, wait, there's someone's up there. So go, yeah, you go ahead first, and if you go to the microphone, we'll be able to all hear you then. So go ahead. Dr. Olson, you mentioned 12 categories. Yes. So there are... Among the thousands of mutations, there are several hotspots in the, the dystrophin gene that many of you here are familiar with. And we've been able to categorize those into 12 different exons that we can correct individually with uh, single guide RNAs for Cas9. So we can then take many different types of mutations in hotspot regions and cluster them and use a single optimized guide RNA with Cas9 to edit. And, and this is a very important point because it, it means that you don't need to have a, a different guide RNA or a different drug-like molecule for every mutation, but you can uh, consolidate many types of mutations into a single gene editing strategy. And this is for other things besides deletions? We've been able to correct uh, point mutations, deletions, and duplications um, by this approach. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, what uh, what boys fall into the twenty percent that cannot be treated? Boys who would not be able to be treated by this approach are boys who have very large deletions of essential regions uh, of the gene. So, if the essential regions of the gene are still present in the genome but are not being appropriately expressed, those are the types that we can correct. And so, that's would fall into the deletion, certain deletions, duplications, and point mutations. So, Eric, maybe you could comment, too, on uh, any efforts to specifically target satellite cells to maintain durability. Other, uh, otherwise, the correction would be quite similar to a gene replacement strategy if only uh, terminally differentiated cells are transduced. So it's a good question. There's, there's two points on this question. One is that the heart, is, the heart failure is the ultimate cause of, of a demise in uh, long-term DMD patients, as all of you well know. There is no stem, efficient stem cell population for the heart, and we've shown that with systemic delivery of CRISPR-Cas9 uh, editing components in adeno-associated virus, that we get stable, long-term restoration of dystrophin protein uh, in the heart, and so that's extremely encouraging. Now, with respect to skeletal muscle, where well, there is a slow turnover, as you know, and a, a contribu progressive contribution from satellite cells, it's been challenging to obtain efficient uh, infection of satellite cells with adeno-associated viruses, although there is a report in the literature from Amy Wager's group uh, that that can occur. And I, I want to make one more point on that. It's, it's a fine point. but. In, by carefully analyzing the efficiency of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, we have found, and others have confirmed this, that the effect on the disease is much more efficient than the actual gene editing process. So it's not necessary to correct 100% of the mutations. Correction at a level of about 15% of the mutant dystrophin protein in, at least in mice, can lead to uh, nearly full restoration of function in, um, in that animal model. Okay. Uh, another question there. Go ahead. A, fo a follow-up on the 20% that would not be amendable. Could you um, elaborate a little bit more on <clears throat> that 20%? So we began the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in a human uh, samples using uh, exon 51 and, and the other uh, dominant uh, types of, of mutations. But if they're in a small number of, of patients, small fraction, roughly 20 percent, don't hold me to that precise number, but roughly 20 percent, if there's a large deletion where essential portions of the gene are simply gone, then in, at least in our initial versions of CRISPR-Cas9 editing, we can't correct those. So we can bypass stop mutations, and we can use exon skipping. Ultimately, I think CRISPR-Cas9 can be used for gene replacement, and it has been used for gene replacement in cells and in animals, but that's a, a much uh, larger challenge, and so we're starting with the uh, simpler approaches first. Pardon me? 
So the question is about frame shift mutations, which would... Frame shift, without getting bogged down in too much terminology, frame shift mutations, a, a point mutation that terminates the, the half of the protein, those are highly amenable to CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, very simple to uh, bypass those types of mutations. And those, those represent a large number of, large fraction of the mutations. So let me back up one step to a question for Jerry regarding um, the eligibility for studies based on prior exposure to AAV and your experience in the young patient population, what might be anticipated in older patients? The immune response? The, the um, eligibility for studies based on pre-exposure to AAV. Well, I think, as you know, Barry, um, over time there is a greater exposure to AAV, and the younger, the younger the patient is, the less likely they are to be to to have been exposed to um, to AAV. AAV two is the most common uh, one that patients are exposed to, and as we become more sophisticated and use um, eight and nine, we have less exposure, but still a considerable amount. But um, this is, I guess, um, the, uh, the, the, basically the pitch for newborn screening, which I am a great enthusiast for. And the more we can deliver genes um, in the newborn period, as we've done in AAV, to, I mean, as we've done in SMA to really make a difference, the better chance we have. Okay, great. There's another question there. This is for Dr. Olson, and you know, apologize if this is not a right question, but this is with reference to off-target editing that we were talking about. And you mentioned that you know we haven't seen a lot of issues with it because our body naturally has the ability to go and fix it. So wouldn't it go back to the non-edited DNA of dystrophin 2? Because naturally it believes that you know it is a in, in the body, it is non-edited. So would it not try to do that if it can go and try to fix the other ones which are edited by mistake? Did I make sense? So could you ask the question one more time? Okay, the question is, <laughs> Yeah. It's about off-target editing. So you mentioned that, you know, we haven't seen any issues of off-target editing yes. because our body naturally goes and fixes itself, correct? So in, in a DMD child, naturally it does not have the dystrophin produced, like the gene is, is not correct. So would it not go back to that version on its own, just uh, like for the others? Okay. No, when, when I mean, yeah, it, it's a, that's a reasonable question. So when I mean that the body has a repair system, it's when, when the DNA in a chromosome gets uh, broken, cut through whatever, uh, whatever occurrence that might be, then the uh, body has the repair mechanisms to repair that. But the, the, in a DMD boy, the body does not recognize that mutation as, uh, as a mutation to be corrected. So it, it's only when... if you in, introduce a mutation, can it be corrected? So we have a very efficient system for doing that. And I, I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, because the cell, the tissues that are being edited in muscular dystrophy, skeletal muscle and heart, are tissues that don't proliferate. Those cells don't divide anyway. They may also be relatively more resistant to possible off-target effects that might be thought to cause cancer or some other uh, adverse effect. So I, I think we absolutely need to be mindful of this, but um, my personal opinion, and I think this is shared by many in the field, is that off-target effects are not likely to be the greatest barrier to the advancement of this technology so far. So I have one question from Abby and then your ex. This is, this is this one. Could we have, um, could you give us a timeline or expectations of when these um, technologies might be available in clinical trials? I guess we have Bamboo, Solid, and Dr. Olson. So Abby has my question. Oh. Okay. okay. You yeah. asked the same question. Excellent. So it's about timing. And, uh, you know, as Carl pointed out, there is a fair bit of clinical experience already a lot of effort towards large-scale manufacturing of vectors that enable studies in larger subjects like boys with GMD of all ages. So I don't know. We can go down the line. Carl, you may want to start. 
So, so we, we're in late stage uh, preclinical testing and we have a lot of things that we need to get put in place before we can move into the clinic. But our goal is sort of to get uh, into the clinic sometime next year. Okay, Jude? I, I think with the demand from production that probably within two years. Okay, in terms of editing studies, the preclinical phase, we're still uh, contemplating. Jerry, so Jerry and I have discussed this a lot and there's discussions underway to start a, a company to specifically address uh, this issue. Uh, I think the fact, if you keep in mind that CRISPR-Cas9 gene technology was only first described less than three years ago in the form that I'm describing, and just in that period of time, it's already been applied to muscular dystrophy cancer and been approved for a trial uh, by the FDA. It's moving with, uh, extraordinary, uh, at an extraordinary pace. So I think within the next few years, we can uh, envision um, initial discussions with the FDA on safety trials. And Jerry and I have had many discussions on that. Jerry, comments? I mean, I was going to point out that, uh, you know, Jerry, it's obviously, it's, you um, appreciate been a pioneer in the clinical application as a clinical neurologist. He's uh, very been very committed to this aspect. Uh, and so it's important to realize these studies are happening now. They're not uh, 10 years from now. And so we don't want to raise expectations beyond what's realistic, but... Um, but, but there are a number of studies that Jerry's doing, both with Follistatin, um, uh, GalGT, uh, others in the works. So maybe you can comment on the implementation of this through the regulatory process and the um, expectations for the patient community. I think it's, it's, e it's easier to uh, comment on if we, if we do gene therapy in a four-week-old SMA baby, we can completely... Uh, reverse the disease. That is, we can take an SMA baby who's supposed to die in two years, and, uh, and we can uh, lead to um, a clinical result that um, goes anywhere from changing to a type one, from a type one to a type two, to a type three, where we have babies that are walking. So the message is newborn screening, newborn screening, newborn screening, so we can treat patients at an earlier age. Uh, with less of an obstacle for how much virus we need. But what about the ones that we have now? Would you consider, I mean, I have a 23-year-old young man who's not 10 years old. Would you just say, oh, oh, he's out? I need to know that as a mother. We wouldn't say no to, to any patient, but first we have to demonstrate proof of principle. Once we demonstrate proof of principle, then we can extend our trials to be more inclusive of older patients. So we would never say no to any patient. We would always target the full population of patients. Yeah. I think they have to be because we have to, we, we have to show efficacy in order to move the field forward. Our best chance of showing efficacy is to do gene therapy on early patients. Once we show that, um, we, we can extend the, the uh, a treatment to other patients like the one you described. Do you see the dilemma? Of course I do. Yeah. It's, it's one that we unfortunately can't control, but if we don't show efficacy, then, then we basically have a false negative uh, result in the clinical trial and, yeah. and it goes nowhere. So, we so have to show proof of principle. Another way to address that, though, is to consider uh, that there may be parallel tracks for the existing patient population who may be non-ambulant. It's reasonable to think that there's potential for benefit related to heart and diaphragm function. So there may be different objectives in different studies. As Jerry said, the earlier studies that are preemptive or um, treating earlier patients may have one objective when patients who are in later stages may have different objectives. So I think we should wait and see how the efficacy studies work uh, through the process of the regulatory agencies and then hope that this is really available to all age groups in, in the near future. That's a very important question. So I think it's important to maybe make a statement about that and get opinions from others uh, on the panel as well. But as we know, the participation in different studies has certain criteria, steroids use or others. 
Oh, the, I repeat the question if you couldn't hear, Mr. Ginder. So he, he asked, would participation in one study um, limit uh, the ability to participate in another study involving gene therapy or even another agent? So we have seen circumstances where exclusion criteria for study list prior participation in a gene therapy study. That exists today. Um, so we know that as a fact, and partly it is because now there is a complex change in the fundamental programming of the cell, and it would potentially confound the understanding of the second therapeutic agent. So as it stands today, until these are licensed products which are given for medical indications, then it's likely that they will be exclusive to one trial or another. Um, it would be very confusing to mix and match them, especially if there are different strategies. If there's a gene replacement combined with a gene editing approach, you can see how these may be confused, the outcome. So as of now, it's seemingly a one-way path. And that's important to understand. And since, as Zhao pointed out, these are very long-lived therapies. We don't know if there will be five- or ten-year intervals, or maybe even in an older patient, uh, only one time administration for their lifetime. Certainly, as Jerry pointed out, in the younger individuals, we don't know the durability yet. Um, but with increased turnover in muscle, if it doesn't involve stem cells, that there may be redosing involved, as Carl pointed out. But as, as of now, we think this is, um, has to commit to one pathway or another. Any other questions? Or we can, uh, I think, um, one more? Come on up. That'll be the last one, and then we'll end this session and certainly interact with people after if needed. Yes? I'm wondering if you can speak briefly to um, general loss of function. So once um, function is lost in certain areas, what can come back, be regenerated because of this, and what mm -hmm. is once lost is gone forever? Anyone want to comment? Jerry? I, I'm, I, I just don't know. I think we see experimentally that we can, we can bring back function um, if we treat uh, either mice in various ones of the muscular dystrophies <clears throat> at older ages. We can, ex we can see a return of function. And Zhao Zhao might want to comment um, whether how much affected um, their golden retriever dog was before they gave gene therapy and what their expectations were and what their findings were? Yeah, it's a very important question about reversibility in many genetic diseases, um, particularly relevant in Duchenne, even though through the value of the golden retriever model, um, the dogs have to be able to maintain self-care. So that unlike in human condition where a lot of assistive uh, modalities are provided that's not uh, possible to maintain the dogs to that age. So we don't know. I think it's exactly what Jerry said is fair. And, and that I can echo my own experience in the eye trials that we assisted with um, that, that were mentioned earlier. We never would have predicted at the outset that one could regain vision in those studies. And so I can just say that uh, in the absence of actually trying, we have to remain optimistic that there is at least a rest that decline or potentially recover function. But we have to try and see. Anyone else? Zhao Zhao? Yeah, I think it's uh, unlikely to regrow a lot, of, a lot of new muscle tissues. But uh, as long as you have some muscle remaining, and if the therapeutic gene reached the muscle and uh, um, um, uh, produced those uh, therapeutic proteins, and the muscle function will improve. That's been demonstrated in, in older mice and also in dogs. We have some older dogs. We treat them uh, um, by isolated limb perfusion, and um, their muscle force indeed increase. Uh, however, if you, the muscle is gone, then that would be difficult to, um, you know, that, that you need a different approach, like a, a stem cell therapy that can regenerate new muscle or something like that. All right. Well, I want to conclude this session. Thank all the expert panelists. Really uh, did an outstanding job. Um.